Hey there gang, welcome back. We're going to be doing a little neck work today and I've had a couple of people ask me about my neck jig in the last little while so I guess this is the opportunity to show it off. It's really nothing fancy. Uh, this is similar to one of Dan Earlywine's earlier designs from the 90s so it's not quite as high tech as the current Stumac version but it works fine for me. I've had it for quite a few years and it really is essential sometimes when you've got a neck that has an odd twist or if it behaves unpredictably, or this case here where we've got a we've got to reshape the fretboard to take care of that excess relief on the neck without having an adjustable truss rod. It's not easy. Don't ask me for plans. You know where to find the real deal, and if you want to be a repair person, you should probably have the innate skill and creativity to come up with something like this that works for you and your needs. And to be honest, if I had 800 bucks and an extra 50 feet of shop space, I'd probably buy the current version and set it up as a workstation because it really is a good tool. I like it. So in simple terms, for those of you who might not understand what this is for, when the guitar is strung up, the tension from the strings can bend or um, distort the neck relative to the body. Usually the neck will bow upwards a bit and the whole fingerboard will take on a gentle curve. And we call that relief. A little bit of that's normal. If you get too much of it, you can have playability issues though, like um, cording will start to feel very stiff in the center of the board, and sometimes you'll get weird buzzes going up around the body joint. Other necks, uh, when they reach tension, will take on a twist, like a corkscrew, and we hate those necks, because those are terrible to work on. Um, if you don't have a jig like this, you'll never get them to work right. Because the thing is, when you take the tension off the neck, it can relax into a very different shape, so if we try to flatten the plane of the frets when it's in that shape, or in this case we're going to be working on the fingerboard, when we put the strings back on, it will spring up into something that's completely different and you'll lose all that hard work you've done. It's very frustrating. So what this does is it holds the shaft of the neck in the position it takes under tension. So I have this dial indicator here, which I zero out when the strings are still on it. And after I take it, the strings off, I can move the support rods uh, up and down to bring it back to where it was previously and I can check that with the measurement from the indicator. And it's good to take the measurement there when the jig is tipped up so the guitar is in the same position it, it gets held when you're playing it. Um, and then of course the whole thing uh, bolts to the front of my workbench with great big lag screws. It's pretty solid. I can do fret work on this and uh, I'm confident because it's, you know, it's not going to move. I started cleaning the board and quickly realized that I was going to sand it all off anyway, so this was a waste of time. Once again, this helps during the removal. Um, the little barbs that are on the tang of the fret um, can cause damage when they get pulled up because as they've been driven in, the fret wire usually starts slightly over, over radiused. As it's driven in, those barbs push slightly sideways into the wood. That's what gives you a good grip. But when it comes time to pull them out, if you come straight up, they can break away material along the edge of the fret slot. Doing this just prevents that from running out farther into the area of the fretboard around it. It's a much cleaner removal. These aren't deep score lines. They're just, you know, on the surface. And just like when I removed the 13th fret to Put the heat stick in. I'm just going to warm up each of the frets with the soldering iron. Those are coming up pretty clean. With the frets removed and a straight edge on the board here, I'm just going to check the amount of relief in the neck, and it is, yeah, it's around 20 thousandths in the center. So that's uh, more than twice what it should be. I'd like to bring it down to about mm, six, seven, eight, somewhere in there. The other thing is, because I'm going to be flattening the board, removing a lot of material, um, I want to remove these outside dot markers here. So I'm just heating them up with some water. A 
the scalpel in there and we'll save those carefully uh, because there's a chance that I could sand through them as I'm leveling the board. I don't want to do that. I'm going to remove the nut. That came off nice and clean. To start off flattening the board, I'm using this level that's got self-adhesive sandpaper. That's 220 grit. It's um, not very coarse, but I kind of want to sneak up on this. Now I'm using a radius sanding block. It's very pretty wood. It's Brazilian. It's got a bunch of big knots in it though. One of the knots had a little crack in it, so I put in some super glue to stabilize it. And on this edge, there was a little chip, which I'll fill with some sanding dust. I'm re-establishing the hole depth for the fingerboard markers. Now to which grit you actually sand this is a matter of conjecture. Um, in the Harmony factory they stopped at probably, I don't know, 120, 150 grit, because they they tend to have lots of scratches on them, and usually they're cross grain scratches from when they were polishing the frets. Um, I think I'll take this to 600, which will be, you know, good and smooth for an old guitar, but it won't be gleaming like the sun. Okay, the relief is now about five thousandths of an inch, which is just about where I want it to be. I'm putting some radius on the wire. I've cleaned this beforehand using some. Um, methyl hydrate. Just going to check the slot depth here. Eh, a little shy. Removing material from the edges has made the slots a little more shallow. So we'll check on the fret saw here to make sure that it's set up. You don't want the slots to be deeper than they have to be. Um, that just makes a loose, wiggly neck and no one needs that. Push the razor saw through here first just to get any dust or gunk out of the bottom of the slot. The last thing to do before putting the frets in is to take a triangular file here and just very lightly chamfer the top edge of the slot. This seems to help the frets go in a little bit more evenly and it also greatly reduces the amount of damage that happens when you take them out again. So if this thing ever gets a sub, uh, fret job in the future, uh, the frets will be easier to remove. I'm filling the fret slots with some fish glue. It could just as easily have been tight bond or regular woodworking glue or even super glue if you're brave. I think that it just sort of locks the frets in there and makes for a stiffer board and, you know, better energy transfer between the fret and the fingerboard. So I'll tap those in with the hammer, just on the ends to get them seated. Then push them all the way down with the fret press. For frets high up on the fingerboard extension, I will make the fit just a little bit looser by filing down some of the barbs on the sides of the frets. This means I don't have to hammer quite so hard. I'm supporting things on the inside with a big block of iron. Because I used glue on the fret slots, um, we have to let that fingerboard dry before I do the final leveling on the frets. Uh, just because the small amount of water can actually swell the fingerboard slightly, it can bend it. So it's good to leave that for a while. Uh, in the interim, I'm going to remove the bridge here. 
To do that, I'm going to use my little silicone heat blanket here. People ask me where I got it. I bought it on Amazon. Uh, I'm not sure whether this particular model is still on there, but it's from ABN, which is Auto Body Now. Uh, they have an online store. I think this was originally designed for heating up the engine blocks of snowmobiles in the winter to make starting easier. Um, this is 1x5. They also make a 2x5 and uh, they're relatively inexpensive. Um, to use this, I plug it into the heat control of my uh, side bending unit. It's like a rheostat. You'd need something like this. You probably wouldn't want to run this full speed because it, it would likely burn up pretty quickly and it would also be too hot for what you're doing. Generally speaking, I like to put the knife so that the blade runs uh, perpendicular to the grain. Um, you think about this, this top, the grain runs like this. And this wide, flat blade is crossing all those grain lines and coming in like this. If you come in from the end, like this, you're in danger of doing a lot more damage. If it hits a soft grain line, it can dive in and uh, split it. The other thing is on softwood tops, uh, especially, you've got run out to consider. And run out, you can think of it like uh, petting a dog's back. You know how the hair likes to sit down nice and smooth and flat in one direction? But if you pet it the opposite way, it will get all roughed up. Softwood tops are like that. So you have to learn how to read which way to go. Oftentimes, if there's a lot of run out in the top, you have to attack one side of the bridge from the back and the other half of the top from this direction. Um, so that you're always going in the direction that, you know, the dog is most happy. Mahogany doesn't have the same kind of run-out characteristics. It grows in a different way. It's got what we call interlocking grain. So almost every other grain line is running in the opposite direction. It doesn't function the same way as a spruce top. This is going to sound counterintuitive, but generally speaking, I find it takes longer to get off a hide glue bridge we're almost done, than a um, one that's been glued on with tight bond. Hide glue is actually pretty resistant to heat. If it doesn't have any moisture around it, guitars can go through a fire and remain in one piece with hide glue. That came off nice and clean. I'm just going to check something here. This guitar has a bridge plate inside and I want to see how far back it goes. It's um, probably around a hundred thousandths of an inch thick, maybe two and a half millimeters. Okay, that's good. So that's where it ends up. So it's just like a regular bridge plate. A little rectangle here. So um, I've got a place to put my bridge pin holes and they'll be supported from underneath. That's very good. Where does it end up? Okay, so it's about 10 millimeters eighths of an inch away from the ends of the bridge. That's perfect. Okay guys, I'm going to call that a day here and uh, I'll edit this video and I'll put this one up. I'll see you again tomorrow.